Welcome to the Ultimate Sports Blog Podcast. Today is Monday, October 22nd, 2018. Today I'm going to recap yesterday's NFL action, look ahead to tonight's Giants-Falcons game. Then I'm going to go over yesterday's NBA and NHL action, look ahead to tonight's slate for both. The Angels and Reds have hired new managers. I'll go over those respectively. I'll do my weekly college football power rankings and guess the lines for week nine Unbelievable. It's week nine in college football already, right already at the halfway point. I'm actually going to do a second half predictions for college football, maybe on tomorrow's podcast. We'll see, depending on how much time I have. And I'm going to close the podcast by going over the eight people in college basketball, which came out today. I'm going to do a lot of college basketball activities within the next couple weeks, previewing all the conferences and making predictions for the season. My college basketball season predictions podcast is going to be out I think some point next weekend or something we'll see about that all right to football we go in what was a crazy first game to begin the day from London the Chargers feed the Titans 20 to 19 the Titans appeared to score the touchdown that would at least tie the game but instead they go for the win and go for two they initially get it and then they call a penalty, and then they do it over, and then it was no good. So the Chargers improved the 5-2. and two. Tennessee drops the 3-4. and four. Phillip Rivers, 19 of 26, 306 yards, two touchdowns. Marcus Mariota, 24 for 32, 237 yards, a touchdown, and the pick. 1 o'clock games yesterday. The Bucks defeated the Browns 26-23 in overtime. This was a fun game with a lot of bad coaching, too, and bad quarterback play. Tampa's 3-3. Three and three. The Browns are 2-4-1. Jameis Winston, 32 of 52, 365 yards, two picks. Baker Mayfield, 23 of 34, 215 yards, and two touchdowns. The Panthers came back from 17-0 down in the fourth quarter to defeat the Eagles 21-17. Impressive win for the Panthers to improve the 4-2. Phillies, 3-4. Cam Newton, 25 of 39, 269 yards and two touchdowns. Carson Wentz, 30 of 37, 310 yards and two touchdowns. The Vikings defeat the Jets 37-17. Impressive win for the Vikings. Many people thought this was a trap game for them. No, they survived and they have a big one next Sunday night against the Saints. I'll talk about that as the weeks go on, or as this week goes on, I should say. Vikings are 4-2-1. Jets are 3-4. Kirk Cousins, 25 of 40, 241 yards and two touchdowns. Sam Darnold, 17 of 42, 206 yards, a touchdown, and three picks. The Lions defeat the Dolphins, 32 21. Impressive win for Detroit, winning on the road against the Miami team that many people thought would pull off the upset. Detroit's 3 and 3. Miami's 4 and 3. Matthew Stafford, 18 of 22, 217 yards, and two touchdowns. Brock Osweiler, 22 of 31, 239 yards, and two touchdowns. The Patriots defeat the Bears, 38 31. The Pats are. 5-2, and two, the Bears are 3-3. Three and three. Give the Pats credit. They took advantage of some mistakes and some bad special teams, and they get the win on a day where a lot of people thought that the Bears were going to pull off the outright upset. Tom Brady, 25-36, 277 yards, three touchdowns and a pick. Mitch Trubisky, 26-50, 333 yards, two touchdowns and two picks. And by the way, Trubisky threw a Hail Mary that landed on the one-yard line a 54-yard pass to Kevin White. And they came so darn close to having a chance to tie the game with an extra point. But give the Bears credit for hanging around. Their offense played pretty well in this game. Their defense obviously was not great. Granted, two of those touchdowns were special teams. Khalil Mack is not 100%. And just another win for Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. The Colts defeated the Bills 37-5. to Yes, that was the score. The Colts are 2-5. and five. The Bills are 2-5. and five. Andrew Luck, 17 of 23, 156 yards and four touchdowns. He didn't do much. Marlon Mack carried the offense, 19 carries for 126 yards and a touchdown. Derek Anderson in his first game in a long time, 20 of 31, 175 yards and three interceptions. He was terrible. The Texans defeated the Jaguars 20-7. to seven. Impressive win for Houston. They're 4-3. and three. Jacksonville's 3-4. Deshaun Watson, 12 of 24, 139 yards and a touchdown. And what was the biggest story of the day, in my opinion, Blake Bortles benched. 6 for 12, 61 yards. Cody Kessler didn't do 
much worse or much better, depending on how you look at it. 21 of 30, 156 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. So the Jaguars look like pretenders. The 4 o'clock games, the Saints defeat the Ravens 24-23. This was a great game. The Saints are 5-1, the Ravens are 4-3. This game came down to a missed extra point by Justin Tucker, which he never misses. That was his first career missed extra point that cost the Ravens a chance to win the game. So give New Orleans credit. Drew Brees... 22-30, 212 yards and two touchdowns. Joe Flacco, 23-39, 275 yards and two touchdowns. The Redskins defeat the Cowboys 20-17. This was also an entertaining game there towards the end. Washington's 4-2, Dallas was 3-4. The Redskins are in first place in the NFC East. Alex Smith was not very good. 14-25, 178 yards and a touchdown. Dak Prescott wasn't much better. 22-35, 273 yards and a touchdown. This came down to... A missed kick at the end by Brett Maher, in which would have sent the game to overtime. But no, Washington hangs on the win. And why he missed the kick, the initial kick would have went in, but the refs called the penalty on the Cowboys. So it went from a 47-yarder to a 52-yarder. Then Maher misses. Washington hangs on and wins. The Rams defeat the 49ers 39-10. to the Rams are 7-0. The Niners are 1-6. Jared Goff, 18 of 24, 202 yards and two touchdowns. C.J. Beathard reverted back to what he is. 15 of 27, 170 yards, a touchdown, and two picks. Last night, the Chiefs defeated the Bengals 45-10. Impressive win for Kansas City as they improved to 6-1. Cincinnati's 4-3. Patrick Mahomes continuing to be the best player in football this year. 28 of 39, 358 yards, four touchdowns, and a pick. Andy Dalton, typical Andy Dalton, terrible primetime game. 15 to 29, 148 yards, a touchdown in the pick. Jeff Driscoll came in at the very end of the game to give the Cincinnati second units some reps there at the end. But give the Chiefs credit. They perhaps played their best all-around game of the year. Their defense made some plays, but the naysayers are going to say, oh, well, Andy Dalton in primetime. That's true, but you've got to give credit. To where credits do sometimes. And tonight you have the Giants and the Falcons, 815 ESPN, Giants 1 and 5, Atlanta's 2 and 4. Two underachieving teams this year. I thought the Falcons would be a playoff team this year. It looks like they probably won't be. The Giants, I thought, would be an improved offensive team, but they look like it some weeks, and in other weeks they don't. And really they're not because Eli Manning has gotten worse and is no longer a good starting quarterback. But sometimes he looks like a competent starting quarterback when Odell Beckham Jr. and Saquon Barkley are making plays, which I think that's a distinct possibility tonight. I have the Falcons winning this game by a score of 34-27, to so I expect the Giants to put up some points tonight. And here's another thing about the Giants and their offense. It tends to do better on the road than it does at home. I just think the fans get on them right away if they don't do anything. That showed in the Eagles game, and that showed in the Saints game there at the tail end of that Saints game. After the Giants actually had a good drive to start that Saints game, and then they faltered. The offense looked good in Carolina and in Houston. And even Jacksonville, the offense wasn't that terrible. It's just that at the time we thought Jacksonville was a good defensive team, which in reality they still are, but... Reality is Blake Bortles stinks, and that's why that game against the Giants was close, and it made the Giant defense look pretty competent that week. But that's what I thought the Giants' issue was going to be. I thought their issue was going to be their defense. I just don't think their defense is very good. A lot of names on it, but they're not living up to reputations, and that's been the case for most of the season. And I certainly didn't expect their offense to be this bad, especially with Odell Beckham Jr. back in healthy and the addition of Saquon Barkley. But those guys are putting up their stats. And I expect Barkley to continue to be great tonight. But like I said, I think the Giants will be competitive. Their offense tends to be better on the road than it is at home. And Atlanta has a ton of injuries on defense. And that's another reason why I think the Giant offense will at least show up tonight. And Atlanta needs this game, though. Because if they lose, they're done. If they win, they can be back in the conversation for the sixth seed in the NFC. Because let's face it. The NFC is not as good as we thought as a whole, and the Giants are a big part of that. I think the Packers are a big reason why 
because I think a lot of people thought that both the Giants and the Packers would be better. They're not. Um, the 49ers, a lot of people thought were going to be good. They obviously lost Jimmy Garoppolo. The Seahawks have overachieved this year a little bit. Detroit's better than I thought. Chicago's way better than I thought. Carolina's weird, although I like that team on paper. The Saints, the Rams, and the Vikings are your big three in the NFC. And the other team that's worse than I expected was Philadelphia. And then Washington and Dallas are pretty much both what I expected. I thought Dallas would be better than expected, which has proven to be true so far this year, even though they're three and four. But yeah, the NFC as a whole is much weaker than I thought. And I think it's because of the three teams that I thought were overrated going into the year in the Giants, Green Bay, and San Francisco. And I thought Seattle was overrated too, but they've exceeded my expectations so far. But enough football talk. Let's go to NBA. Only a few games last night. There was one big surprise result. Actually, two surprise results last night. The Hawks defeat the Cavaliers 113-111. That was one of them. As... Atlanta improves the 1-2. and two. Cleveland's 0-3. Trey Young was the best player on the court last night. 35 points. 2 rebounds and 11 assists. 13 of 23 shooting. 6 three-pointers on 14 attempts. 38 minutes. Kate Bazemore had a solid game. 23 points, 5 rebounds, 4 assists for Atlanta. Meanwhile, for Cleveland, Kevin Love had a double-double. 16.7 rebounds. Only shot 6 for 19, though. 1 for 8 from 3. 34 minutes. C.D. Osmond regressed after some good games. 12 points on 5 for 15 shooting, 2 for 6 from 3 with 3 rebounds and 4 assists. Jordan Clarkson did a nice job off the bench. 19 points with 3 rounds, 2 assists. 7 for 12 shooting, 3 for 5 from 3 in 23 minutes. And the other surprise was the Kings defeating the Thunder 131-120 to in Russell Westbrook's return game. Sacramento's 1-2, and OKC's 0-3. Westbrook had a nice game, though. 32 points, 12 rebounds, 8 assists. So a typical West Russell Westbrook game on 13 of 23 shooting in 35 minutes. Paul George had a big game, 29 points, 6 rebounds, 2 assists, 10 for 18 shooting in 33 minutes. Dennis Schroeder off the bench, 14 points, 4 rebounds, 8 assists on 5 for 16 shooting. Sacramento, Amon Shumpert had a great game. He has that random game where he's hot from three every once in a while. 26 points, three rounds, four assists, nine for 13 shooting, four for seven from three. De'Aaron Fox continues to show improvement. 22 points, four rebounds, 10 assists on seven for 12 shooting. Marvin Bagley off the bench, 13.7 rebounds on five for 13 shooting in 24 minutes. The Nuggets defeat the Warriors 100-98. So the Nuggets are 3-0. and Golden State drops to 2-1. and This game was sealed on a... Blocked by Juan Hernan Gomez. It was a Damian Jones layup that Hernan Gomez blocked to seal a big win for Denver. The best player on the court for them might have been Gary Harris, who had 28 points on 10, I'm sorry, 11 for 20 shooting. Only 2 for 9 from 3 in 35 minutes. Nikola Jokic, you could argue, was the best player on the court, too. 23 points, 11 rebounds, 6 assists on 7 for 14 shooting in 32 minutes. Golden State's stars showed up. Stephen Curry, 30 points, 4 rebounds, 6 assists on 10 for 23 shooting, 6 for 16 from 3. Kevin Durant, 20 points, 11 rebounds, 7 assists on 7 for 19 shooting, 39 minutes. Klay Thompson, 15 points, 7 rebounds, but no assists on... 7 for 16 shooting. Kevin Looney off the bench. 10 points, 6 rebounds, 4 for 4 shooting in 19 minutes. The Clippers defeated the Rockets 115-112. Chris Paul is obviously suspended for this game. Tobias Harris led the way for the Clippers scoring-wise. 23 points, 4 rebounds and assists on 9 for 15 shooting, 2 for 5 for 3 in 35 minutes. Daniel Gallinari continues to play well. 20 minutes, or I'm sorry, 20 points. Nine rebounds, four assists in 32 minutes. Seven for 19 shooting. Only hit one three-pointer on seven attempts. Montrezl Harrell off the bench. 17 points and 10 rebounds, three assists. Eight for 10 shooting, 24 minutes. Meanwhile, for the Clippers, James Harden, or I'm sorry, the Rockets, 
James Harden, typical Harden game, 31 points, 4 rebounds, 14 assists, 11 for 26 shooting, 4 for 12 from 3. Clint Capella continues to play well, 23 points, 6 rebounds, 5 assists, 11 for 14 shootings in 34 minutes. Eric Gordon filled in for the suspended Chris Paul starting at shooting guard. 21 points, 5 rebounds, and 2 assists on 7 for 18 shooting, 5 for 8 from 3 in 33 minutes. Carmelo Anthony off the bench, 9 points and 6 rebounds and 1 assist, 3 for 8 shooting, 1 for 3 from 3 in 27 minutes. Joel Green off the bench, 11 points and 4 rebounds, 4 for 8 shooting, 2 for 6 from 3 in 21 minutes. Bigger slate tonight at 7.30 on NBA TV. You have the Magic and the Celtics. The Magic are 1-2 and two, and Boston's 2-1. and one. Hornets and the Raptors, 7.30. Hornets 2-1, and one, Raptors 3-0. And, oh. and this is the game where I think the big underdog has a chance to win out. I am not calling for the Charlotte upset, but I think it has a better chance of happening than giving credit for it. I think the Hornets covered, but I'm not sure if they pull out the upset. But taking them on the money line is worth it. Just throwing it for those gambling nuts out there. The Pacers and the Timberwolves. Pacers 2-1, and one, Timberwolves 1-2. One and two. This is the most likely underdog to win outright, in my opinion. The Pacers. Because of all the Timberwolves drama. And I kind of like how Indiana's played this year. I'm not really faulting them for the Bucks loss because the Bucks have Giannis Adetokounmpo and the Pacers don't. That's just simple. Knicks and the Bucks. Speaking of Giannis Adetokounmpo, the Bucks are 2-1. and one. The Knicks are 1-2, and two, but the Knicks are playing better than 1-2. and two. They've hung around with superior teams in their two losses. Well, the Nets aren't that much superior, although the Celtics are. But the naysayers are going to say the Knicks hung around in that game because Gordon Hayward didn't play. Gordon Hayward, to me, he's a great player, but he might not even be the one of their best three players this year. I think their three best players this year are going to be Jason Tatum, Al Horford, and Kyrie Irving. I'd put... Gordon Hayward, number four, and then I'd put Jalen Brown and Terry Rozier, five and six. So, there you go. But the Knicks, you got to be proud if you're a Knicks fan of how they played for these first couple games. Yeah, they're one and two, but the way they hung around with the Celtics was nice. And then the Nets, who are better than the Knicks, but they're not by far better than the Knicks. The Knicks hung around with them, too, and then they blew out the Atlanta Hawks, who just won by double digits against the Cavs in Cleveland. But who knows, the Cavs might be worse than we thought, especially on the defensive end. 8.30 at the Bulls and the Mavericks. The Bulls are 0-2, the Mavs are 1-1. The Grizzlies and the Jazz at 9 o'clock, both these teams are 1-1. I really like this Jazz team. I don't think the Grizzlies stand a chance tonight. 10 o'clock, the Wizards and the Blazers. The Wizards are 0-2 and Portland's 2-0. Good chance for the Blazers to go to 3-0 tonight with the 0-2 Wizards in town. And it's their first game in a West Coast trip. 10-30, Suns, Warriors. Suns at 1-1, Golden State's 2-1. I expect the Warriors to bounce back unless they rest people. And then on NBA TV at 10-30 tonight, you have the Spurs and the Lakers from Staples Center. The Lakers are a little bit under pressure to get the win tonight. This is another possible... Underdog outright upside. The Spurs, they're one and a half point dog. They're favored in some places, but the SPN line says Lakers by one and a half. The Lakers should be favored in this game because they have the best player, obviously. You can make a case that the Lakers could have won that game if not for the brawl because momentum was on their side the other night, and then the brawl changed everything, even though that Chris Paul got ejected from the Rockets. The Rockets role players and James Harden kept stepping up. And LeBron's supporting cast wasn't. And obviously the loss of Rajon Rondo and Brandon Ingram in that game proved to be vital for the Lakers. And that's what I think swung that game the other night. But I expect the Lakers to get their first win tonight at home against a team that I don't think is going to be that good this year. And they didn't look good in Portland the other night. Although I could be totally wrong and DeMar DeRozan could light it up and win that game by himself. But we'll see. Hockey. Only three games on the slate last night. The Flames defeated the Rangers for the one impressive win for Calgary going into MSG and beating the Rangers. The Rangers have been competitive all year so far, and this is the first game where they really laid an egg. Calgary improves to 5-3. and three. Rangers drop to 2-5-1. and one. Number one star of the game, the backup goalie, who had 44 saves on 45 shots, David 
Riddich. Very, very impressive. Number two star of the game with two goals, Johnny Gaudreau. Number three star of the game with two goals, Garnett Hathaway. So a very good win for Calgary against a Ranger team that has played better than its record so far other than last night. But in the other case you can be made for the Rangers is that that goalie played out of his mind for Calgary. Lundqvist kept the minute for a while. The Rangers got a goal to get on the board in the third, but give Calgary credit. They won the game on the road, the first game of an East Coast trip for them. An impressive win for the Tampa Bay Lightning, 6-3 over the Blackhawks. The Blackhawks finally lose a game convincingly. The Lightning improved the 5-1-1. One, one. The Blackhawks dropped the 4-2-2. Two, two. Number one started the game with a goal and two assists. Braden Point, number two started the game with a goal and an assist. Nikita Kucherov, number three started the game with a goal and an assist. Victor Hedman. An impressive win for the Buffalo Sabres, 4-2 over the Anaheim Ducks. Buffalo's 5-4, Anaheim is 5-3-1. The number one star of the game with an assist, Jack Geichel. Number two star of the game with a goal, Sam Steele. Number three star of the game, didn't have a point but just played a good game, Hampus Lindholm. So an impressive win for the Sabres. Impressive back-to-back, beating the Kings in L.A. and the... uh, Ducks and Anaheim for a young Sabres team that I think is on the rise. So very ironic that the three road teams won last night. One of them were a dog. The Flames and the Lightning were favored over the two rebuilding teams in the Rangers and the Blackhawks. Well, the Blackhawks aren't really rebuilding, but I think they should be, but they're just not. Tonight, four games. The Avs and the Flyers at 7 o'clock. Avs are 5-1-2. and two. The Flyers are 4-4. Four and four. Flyers, their last performance was a good win over the Devils. The Avs are playing a little better as well. That should be a fun one from Philadelphia. 7.30 of the Hurricanes and the Red Wings. The Canes are 4-3-1. and one. The Red Wings are 1-5-2. and two. The Red Wings finally won a game. It was on the road against, I believe it might have actually been Carolina of all teams. They finally got their win against. No, I'm sorry, it was Florida. You know what it was? I was thinking Carolina because it was against the Florida Panthers and I always confuse it and say the Carolina Panthers are as the football team, but it was Florida, not Carolina, that ended up uh, suffering a loss to Detroit at home. At 8 o'clock on the NHL Network, you have the Blues and the Jets. That's the best game on the slate tonight, at least on paper, although Abs Flyers is pretty good too. Blues are 2-3-2. and two. The Jets are 5-2-1. and one. The Blues are coming off that nice win in Toronto over the Leafs. Interested to see how they perform against their division rival. And at 10 o'clock tonight, you have the Capitals and the Canucks. The Caps are 3-2-2. Two, two. The Canucks are 5-3. and three. The Canucks are, I think, the surprise of the Western Conference to start the year other than Chicago. But I think there's a chance that the Canucks pull off the upset tonight at home against the Capitals team that has been a little Jekyll and Hyde this, so far this season. The Angels have hired Brad Ausmus as their new manager. Ausmus, as we know, was... The former manager of the Detroit Tigers, he replaced Davey Johnson. He was there for four years, and he was fired after the 2017 season and was replaced by Ron Gardenhire. Allsmith did a good job for a few years, but he was fired because, A, the Tigers stunk, and, B, they underachieved a couple of those years under Allsmith. But we'll see how he does, given a second chance. And I wonder if the Angels will continue to go by like the analytics and whatnot and how much uh, Osmus will buy into that. And the Cincinnati Reds also have a new manager that was hired yesterday, David Bell, who had their press conference today. He replaces Jim Riggleman, and Riggleman was their intern manager after the firing of Brian Price, and Riggleman did okay, I thought, but I don't think he did enough to uh, get the intern tag removed. I thought he was going to get it removed, but he didn't, and the Reds, I guess, did the right thing. But hey, speaking of intern managers getting the Intern tag removed. Uh, Mike Schilt, the Cardinals, they removed his intern tag. They thought they were making the playoffs and made a push for it. They ended up missing the playoffs. They collapsed at the end of the year. 
because of their brutal schedule. The Brewers are playing well at the time, and I think they're playing the Cubs at Wrigley, and the Cubs needed those games. But we'll see if that ends up panning out for St. Louis in the long run. And speaking of managerial news, Joe Girardi has withdrawn from consideration from the Rangers job now. He was in consideration for the Reds, but he withdrew himself from them too. Yankee fans have the saying, it's not what you want, because that's Joe Girardi's favorite line that he used to say in press conferences with the Yankees when he was the Yankee manager. And what he probably wants is the Cubs job, because Joe Madden has a year left on his contract. He was brought back, and they didn't extend him, so Madden's pretty much a scapegoat right now. And if he's fired next year, maybe Joe Girardi's the Cubs manager in 2020. We'll see about that. Now I'm going to do my college football power rankings. As I do each and every week, I go from 130 to 1. Number 30 is UTEP, 129 San Jose State. 128 Texas State, 127 Rice, 126 Kent State, 125 Bowling Green, 124 Central Michigan, 123 Western Kentucky, 122 Old Dominion, 121 Yukon. Those are the 10 worst teams in the country. Let's keep going. 120 New Mexico State, 119 UMass, 118 Georgia State, 117 South Alabama. Those Four teams are pretty bad, too, but they sometimes show some life when they play. 116 is Rutgers. They're the worst Power 5 team. 115, UTSA. They're worse than I thought. 114, Charlotte. They're a little Jekyll and Hyde. Pulled off some upsets this year. 113, East Carolina. They're Jekyll and Hyde, too. 112, Tulane. They're a weird team. 111, ULMLV. They've disappointed me. Another big disappointment is 110 Wyoming, 109 Kansas, typical Kansas, going back to Kansas after winning two non-con games. 108 Oregon State, I'm surprised at how bad they've been after showing life in Ohio State in week one, putting up some points, and then they beat an FCS team, I believe, and then they just kept losing and losing and losing. And I know they had the tough road game at Nevada that they hung around in, but I thought they'd play better in Pac-12 play, especially in their home building. 107 is Louisiana. They've hung in some games with some of the better teams in the Sun Belt this year. 106 is Tulsa. Like Louisiana, except in the AAC, they've hung around with some of their conference foes that are better than them this year, such as South Florida and Houston. 105 is North Carolina. They've underachieved this year. Larry Fedora is probably going to be fired. 104 is Southern Miss. They've been a little Jekyll and Hyde, too. They might make a bowl. 103 is Arkansas. They're terrible, even though they beat Tulsa the other day. 102, Illinois. They're not good. 101, Liberty. They pulled off some upsets this year. 100 is Miami of Ohio. They're actually playing a little bit better than their ranking may suggest. 99 is Akron. 98 is Ball State. Two more teams from the MAC that have shown some improvement this year. 97 is Colorado State. They're playing a lot better of late. They've turned into a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde team as well. 96 is Coastal Carolina. Pulled off some upsets this year. 95 is Air Force. 94 is New Mexico. Both of these teams have shown some flashes in conference play and are both able to score some points. 93 is Louisiana Monroe. They've been improved this year. 92 is Florida Atlantic, arguably the most disappointing group of five team in the country. 91, Middle Tennessee, 90, Marshall, 89, FIU, three CUSA teams that I think have overachieved this year, especially FIU, 88, Louisville, the biggest disappointment in the ACC this year for sure, 87 is Navy, they're probably the most disappointing team in the American, 86 is SMU, they've pulled off some upsets this year, they can sneak their way to a bowl game, 85 is Eastern Michigan, They've been pretty solid this year. 84, Pitt. They've picked off some teams at home this year. 83 is Nebraska. They finally are in the win column. 82 is Minnesota. That's who Nebraska beat, but Minnesota's not a bad team. They just have to get it right a little bit. 
81 is Kansas State, who's been a little Jekyll and Hyde. I think this is the second worst team in the Big 12. 80 is Arizona. They lost Khalil Tate, and they actually hung around with UCLA a little bit over the weekend, which impressed me. 79 is Wake Forest. They're a little bit Jekyll and Hyde, too. They might make a bowl. 78 is Arizona State. Terrible loss to Stanford on Thursday night. I thought they'd win that game. 77 is Arkansas State, one of the better teams in the Sun Belt. 76 is UCLA. They've been one of the more improved teams in the country over the last few weeks. I think they have a couple more upsets in them. Potentially maybe over their in-state rival, USC, within the next couple weeks. I don't even know when they play, but we'll see about that. 75 is Troy, one of the best teams in the Sun Belt. 74 is Georgia Southern. I think they're the surprise of the Sun Belt this year. 73 is Hawaii. They've regressed after a little bit of a hot start. They're going to be in a bowl game. 72 is Ohio, who I think is going to be better as the year goes on. 71 is Toledo, another team that I think is going to eventually improve. 70 is Nevada, a good win at Hawaii, two more wins until a bowl. 69, Northern Illinois. They're one of the better teams in the MAC. They're in first place in their division. 68 is Western Michigan. They've overachieved this year. 67 is Louisiana Tech, one of the better teams in conference USA this year. 66 is BYU, another overachiever this year. 65 is Tennessee. They've been better than I expected, especially with that upset win over Auburn. And then they lay an egg against what appeared to be a healthy Tua Tagovailoa and the Alabama Crimson Tide. 64 is Vanderbilt. They've, are, they've been in a little bit of a free fall. They're 3-5. and five. They have to win three more games to become bowl eligible. 63 is UAB. You can make a case they're the best team in Conference USA this year. But I think that is the number 62 team, North Texas. They've been the most impressive. I can't wait to see these two teams go head-to-head -head if they didn't already. Update, they're, they don't go head-to-head -head this year. My bad. And they're in the same division. I think that's ridiculous. Bad job by the CUSA. 61 is Georgia Tech. They've been a little Jekyll and Hyde this year. Have played bad against the good teams and have played great against the bad teams. 60 is Virginia. They had an impressive win at Duke, but I really don't think they're that great. Duke is still missing their quarterback, so kind of makes sense why Virginia won that game. 59 is Memphis. They're 4-4. Four four. I expect them to get the 6 eventually. 58 is Maryland, who has been Jekyll and Hyde as well. They got shut out against Iowa. They've actually been trending down the last couple weeks. 57 is Indiana. They're 4-4. Four four. They're two more wins away from a bull. 56 is Baylor, another team that's two more wins away from a bull. I really like what the Bears have shown this season. 55 is Missouri, another solid team that's kind of in that range. They're in the SEC. I think they'll eventually get to a bull. They had a very good win over Memphis over the weekend. I was very, very impressed with the Tigers. 54 is Cal. Dominant win at Oregon State. This team might have end up getting to a bowl game. But we'll see about that. That UCLA loss is going to hurt them, I think. 53 is Utah State. They're one of the more improved group of five teams this year. You can make a case the team probably belongs in the AP pull top 25. 52 is Army. This is one of my favorite stories in college football this year. In the past few years, too, the improvement of this program. They beat Navy the last two years. They might beat Navy again this year. And they're certainly capable of beating a Power 5 team. They nearly knocked off Oklahoma. Don't forget that, folks. 51 is Temple who I think is a very good team in the AAC. They just got off to a slow start. They finally have turned it on a little bit. Good win for them over the weekend against Cincinnati. 50 is Buffalo. I think the most underrated group of five team in the country this year. They're 6-1 and one with their one loss coming against Army. I probably should have put Army ahead of Buffalo, but that was my mistake. 49 is Boise State, who... Is underachieved a little bit this year, but I still think they're a solid team in the Mountain West. 48 is South Carolina. They're 3-3. Three three. This team went 9-3 last year. Somebody 
pointed that out to me recently, and I just kind of like, oh, wow. And they're 3-3 three and three right now. They'll probably end up getting to a bowl game. They have some home games left against some uh, inferior opponents. 47 is TCU, a team that's underachieved this year pretty badly. They lost Oklahoma at home the other day. They have a tough schedule coming up. I think there's a chance that TCU doesn't even make a bowl. That It's a little conceivable, but I just need to see how their schedule breaks. I think they have Kansas this week, so that's probably a win for them. 46 is Northwestern. They have turned a corner after starting the year 1-3. and three. They had the upset win over Michigan State. That really, really helped them. If they win this week against Wisconsin, I think a bowl is an absolute lock for them. 45 is Florida State. They've turned it on after a slow start, too. They're 4-3. and three. They'll probably make a bowl. 44 is Ole Miss. It's too bad that they are on probation this year, or else it would have been an interesting SEC this year, or I should say a more interesting SEC if they were relevant. 43 is Syracuse, a team that's very improved this year. They're a one win away from becoming bull eligible, and Dino Babers has just been phenomenal this year as a coach. 42 is Fresno State and 41 is San Diego State. These two teams are tied for first in the Mountain West Western Division. And they're certainly the best two teams in their conference this year. I'm very interested to see if these two teams will eventually play each other. I Let's hope they do, unlike UAB in North Texas. And they do on November 17th, and it's a primetime game. And it's at Fresno. And then Fresno has to go to Boise State the week before, and that is a Friday night game on ESPN2. So keep an eye on that. And Fresno's lone loss came at Minnesota on that interception that cost him that game. And then San Diego State's lone loss came in week one at Stanford. And they've just been lights out ever since. And that's not a bad loss, let's be honest, because Stanford's pretty good. Number 40 is Iowa State. They're a very good team. They killed West Virginia, I believe that was last week. Not this past week, but the week before that. Number 39 is Duke, who just lost to Virginia. 38 is Boston College. They have a big one this week against Miami at home. 37 is Colorado. They just lost a tough one to Washington. 36 is USC. This team's in trouble a little bit, although they need two more ones to get a bowl. But you know who's in trouble? Clay Helton in terms of job security. 35 is Oklahoma State. They're also 4-3. and three. They have a big one at home against Texas to spoil the Big 12 conversation a little bit. 34 is Appalachian State. They're the number 25 team in the country. Good for them. Their lone loss came at Penn State in a game that they had the lead in, and then Penn State came back and beat them. And I believe that game went to overtime, too, and Penn State knocked them off in OT. 33 is Purdue, who's coming off the big-time win over Ohio State. 32 is Cincinnati, who just lost their first game at Temple. 31 is Houston, who's been playing great football. Lane has a big one against USF on Saturday. And USF's number 30. They're 7-0. But I think there's a great chance that they suffer their first loss of the season on Saturday at Houston. 29 is Michigan State. A little bit of a letdown at home against Michigan. 28 is Texas Tech who's been playing good football since they lost to West Virginia. 27 is Auburn. They've been Jekyll and Hyde. They've had a bounce-back win against Ole Miss. 26 is Mississippi State, who is coming off a loss at LSU. 25 is Miami, who is coming off a bye, I believe, and then two weeks ago they lost at Virginia. Virginia's actually playing very good football. I probably should have had them higher than I had them. Regretting that one a little bit. 24 is Virginia Tech. They've been a little Jekyll and Hyde, too. They have a big one. I believe it's Thursday night at home against Georgia Tech. 
23 is Stanford. Good bounce back win against Arizona State after losing at home to Utah. And Utah's 22. They're in the driver's seat right now in the Pac-12 South. And they're finally ranked. 21 is Texas A&M. Who's been playing good football lately. Their two losses came against the two best teams in the, in the country in Alabama and Clemson. 20 is NC State. They got crushed by Clemson as I have to give credit to Chris Felica of College Game Day who called that one because a lot of people thought that NC State would cover, including myself. 19 is Iowa, who's been playing phenomenal football lately. Their lone loss came against Wisconsin at home. And speaking of Wisconsin, they're 18. They're playing a little bit better of late. They have a tough one on Saturday at Northwestern. 17 is Penn State. Good bounce back win at Indiana, although it was a hang-on-to-your-life type of game for them. 16 is Washington. They had a good bounce back win over Colorado. 15 is Oregon. Tough loss at Wazoo. They have a good chance to bounce back at Arizona this week. 14 is West Virginia. They're coming off a bye. And in the week before, they lost terribly at Iowa State. They have a good chance to bounce back this week. They're home Thursday night against Baylor. 13 is Kentucky, who's been playing great football and still has an outside chance at getting to the SEC championship game. The SEC East is much better than I expected especially with the emergence of Florida and Kentucky. And 12 is Washington State. They had the impressive win against Oregon, and now they're in the driver's seat for the Pac-12 North unless they lose to Stanford on Saturday. 11 is UCF, still undefeated. Now the question is, when are they going to lose? Who knows if it's going to be this season. 10 is Florida. I talked to them about them a little bit a couple minutes ago. Their lone loss, ironically, came at home against Kentucky. They've been rolling since then. And now they uh, have a game day game against Georgia. Good for them. Nine is Ohio State. Bad loss to Purdue. But I, like I said the other day, I kind of think it was meant to be because of that student that was diagnosed with cancer. I just kind of thought it was a little bit of a it was meant to be kind of a thing. And it's not Ohio State's fault, really. I think they're getting too much blame. This is still a very good team that I think has a chance to make the college football playoff with one loss to a Purdue team that isn't bad. It is Oklahoma, who's been playing good football, other than the loss against Texas in a game that they probably should have won that game in hindsight. Seven is Georgia, who is playing good football. Their lone loss came against LSU. They have the game in Jacksonville against Florida, which game day is going to this week. That's going to be a great game. Six is Texas right now, the best team in the Big 12. They haven't lost since the first week against Maryland in what was a quasi-road game for Texas. That game was played at the Redskins Stadium, which is in Landover, Maryland, which makes sense to why Maryland won that game. And Maryland, for some reason, has had Texas's number. But Texas is playing good football, but this week is very hard for them as they go to Stillwater to take on Oklahoma State. That's going to be a phenomenal game called by Chris Fowler, Kirk Herbstreet, and the Bear, and Maria Taylor on Saturday night. I can't wait for that. Five is Michigan, who has been the most improved team, in my opinion, since week one after they lost to Notre Dame. And... And I really expect them to come out and uh, keep playing this way. Although they have Ohio State still left on their schedule, that's going to be a huge game in the Big Ten later on in the year. Fours LSU, they got the big win over Mississippi State, which means that game day next Saturday will be going to Baton Rouge for their game against Alabama. I believe they went there two years ago, in which I believe was Ed Orgeron's first game as coach, if I'm not mistaken. And LSU kept that game close, and Alabama pulled away late. That was the year that Bama lost to Clemson in the title game. And I can't wait for that game. Both of those teams are on a bye this week. I'll talk about Bama in a minute. Three's Notre Dame. They're still undefeated. They deserve a lot of props. Pound the back to Brian Kelly. Two's Clemson. They've just been rolling lately. Great win over NC State. And number one, obviously, is Alabama. Another good win at a Tennessee team in which upset Auburn. And they're on a bye this week. And like I said, game day's probably going to Baton Rouge for their game against LSU in two, in two weeks from now. So 
That should be fun. Guess the lines for week number nine. There's a couple lines that haven't been posted yet, mainly because of injuries to some teams. I'm going to start with tomorrow night. Troy is at South Alabama. I have Troy minus 13 and a half. Troy's minus 11 and a half. So two points off. Baylor at number 13, West Virginia. I have the Mountaineers by 17 and a half. The Mountaineers are minus 14, so three and a half off there. Ball State at Ohio on Thursday night as well. I have Ohio minus 12 and a half. Ohio is minus 10, so two and a half points off. Toledo at Western Michigan, and I have the Broncos by three. The Broncos are minus six, three points off. Number 25, Appalachian State at Georgia Southern. I have App State minus seven and a half. App State's minus eight, so a half point off. That's going to be a fun game in the Sun Belt between the best team in the conference against the biggest surprise in the conference. Georgia Tech at Virginia Tech, I have the Hokies by 12, and the Hokies are minus three and a half. So that was my first big discrepancy of the segment of the podcast. I was eight and a half points off. And I think it's because of the Josh Jackson thing. Why that line's so low. Louisiana Tech at FAU. Friday night I have the lane train by six. And they're only laying two and a half. So I was three and a half points off there. FAU, like I said, has been the most disappointing group of five team this year, in my opinion. Miami at Boston College. I have the Canes by two. The Canes are minus three and a half. So I was a point and a half off there. Indiana at Minnesota. I have Minnesota by five and a half. A line hasn't been posted yet, and like I said, there's a lot of lines that haven't been posted yet due to injuries. Oh, he, he, we have a line now, and Indiana's minus two and a half, and the line hasn't been really posted yet because of the status of running back Rodney Smith from Minnesota, who's out with an injury, and their quarterback, Zach Anastad, is questionable, so Indiana's minus two and a half, so that's why... That line makes some sense now. Because I didn't realize how many key players from Minnesota were hurt. Wyoming at Colorado State, I have the Rams minus one and the Rams are minus three. So two points off. Also Friday night in what should be a fun game. In Los Angeles. I have number 23, Utah, laying 6.5 against the Bruins. And it's Utah minus 10, so I was 3.5 off there. The Saturday slate for this weekend, number 2, Clemson at Florida State. I have Clemson minus 13.5, and and Clemson is laying 14, so a half point off. Number 20, Wisconsin at Northwestern. I have Wisconsin minus 7, Wisconsin's minus 6, so one point off. Vandy at Arkansas, Vandy minus four and a half, and Vandy's only minus one. Texas Tech at Iowa State, I have the Cyclones minus five and a half, the Cyclones are minus four. That line's a little low to me, so it was a point and a half off. Wake at Louisville, I have Wake minus four, Louisville's minus one and a half. That's ridiculous. Louisville, like I said, has been the most disappointing team in the ACC this year, unless you still have that Florida State argument, but... Florida State's starting to play a little better and are turning into the team that I thought they'd be. So it's got to be Louisville at this point. Massachusetts at Connecticut. What a terrible game. I have UConn minus three. A line hasn't been posted for this yet. Oh, wait, yes, it has. UMass is minus four and a half. And now the line's been posted because... Massachusetts quarterback Andrew Ford and running back Marquise Young are questionable. So that's why there wasn't a line posted. But Massachusetts is minus four and a half at UConn. And that line just reeks. Army at Eastern Michigan. I have Army minus four and a half. This is another game where a line originally wasn't posted. It's because of the status of Army quarterback Kelvin Hopkins Jr., who is questionable. And Eastern Michigan is a two-point favorite, so they must know something about this Army QB that I didn't know he was hurt. I had Army minus 
four and a half there. Purdue at Michigan State, I have Sparty by seven. Sparty's only a two-point favorite. Central Michigan and Akron, I have Akron minus six and a half. Akron is minus five and a half, so one point off. Bethune Cookman at Nebraska wasn't posted because that is a FCS team in Bethune Cookman and a makeup game for Nebraska, pretty much. North Carolina at Virginia, I have Virginia minus 10. Virginia's minus 9, so one point off. Southern Miss at Charlotte, I have Southern Miss by 3.5. Southern Miss is by 7.5, so four points off. Coastal Carolina at Georgia State, I have Coastal by 2.5. And, and there wasn't a line originally posted because of the injury to Coastal's quarterback, Hilton Anderson, and Georgia State's quarterback, Dan Ellington. A line is finally out, and it's Coastal Carolina minus 3.5. So, I was a point off there. Next up, TCU at Kansas. I have TCU minus 16 and a half. TCU is minus 15 and a half. Oregon State at Colorado. I have Colorado minus 14 and a half. Colorado is minus 23 and a half. Boy, Oregon State's really bad. I must have... Overreacted a little bit there. Number nine, Florida at, or I'm sorry, versus number seven, Georgia from Jacksonville. I have Georgia minus six and a half. Georgia's minus seven, so a half point off. Kansas State at Oklahoma. I have the number eight team in the country laying 23 and a half, and that's what the line is. So my first correct pick of the podcast. Great game in Happy Valley. Number 18, Iowa, at number 17, Penn State. I have Penn State minus 8.5, and, and Penn State is minus 4.5, so 4 points off. Number 21, South Florida, at Houston. I have Houston minus 3.5. Houston's minus 7.5, so 4 points off. Arizona State at USC. I have the Trojans by 7. And this was another one where a line wasn't posted because of the injury status to USC quarterback JT Daniels. And the Trojans are laying 6.5, so that was a half point off on that line. Next up is Illinois at Maryland. I have Maryland minus 10.5 and and Maryland's minus 17. Duke at Pitt. I have Duke minus 4.5 and and Duke's minus 2.5. Two Two points off there. Middle Tennessee at Old Dominion. I have Middle Tennessee minus 6.5. Middle Tennessee's minus 4, so I was off by 2.5 points. Northern Illinois at BYU. I have BYU minus 3. BYU is minus 7.5. 4.5 points off. Cincinnati at SMU. I have Cincinnati minus 7. Cincinnati's minus eight and a half, so a point and a half off. Number 12, Kentucky at Missouri. I have Kentucky minus five. It says Missouri minus seven. I'm curious to see if there is an injury to why that line is that big in favor of Mizzou, which in my opinion shouldn't be the case because Mizzou, or I'm sorry, Kentucky has one loss. Benny Snell Jr. is probable, so that might be it a little bit. Maybe they know something that I don't. Maybe that, Or maybe that line is just wrong. New Mexico at Utah State. I have Utah State minus 12, and Utah State's minus 22. Rice at North Texas. I have North Texas minus 27.5. North Texas is minus 28, so it's a half point off. Number 15, Washington at Cal. I have Washington minus 14.5, and, and it's minus 10.5, so I was four points off. UNLV at San Jose State, I have UNLV minus 8.5. UNLV is minus 1. Number 14, Washington State at number 24, Stanford. I have Stanford minus 3. Stanford's minus 3.5. Number 16, Texas A&M at Mississippi State, I have the Bulldogs minus 3. Bulldogs are minus 3, so that was a correct pick. So that was my second correct pick on the podcast. Number 22, NC State at Syracuse, I have NC State minus 10.5. And, and unbelievably, it is a pick em. I can't believe how many people really like Syracuse in this spot. I just think it's an overreaction from their loss against Clemson. Boise State at Air Force. I have Boise minus 16.5. Boise's minus 10. Arkansas State at Louisiana. I have Arkansas State minus 8.5. Arkansas State's minus 3.5. Tulane at Tulsa. I have Tulsa minus 2.5. Tulsa's minus 3, so a half point off. New Mexico State at Texas State, I have New Mexico State minus 4.5. New Mexico State is 
getting two and a half. I can't believe the Bobcats are favored. UAB at UTEP. I have UAB minus 18 and a half. It's minus 17. Tennessee at South Carolina. I have South Carolina minus 13. South Carolina is minus seven and a half. There wasn't a line originally because there was an injury concern with Tennessee quarterback Jarrett Gortinano, who is now probable for the game. South, Ca- South Carolina is laying seven and a half in this spot. I thought the line would be higher than that, but no. FIU at Western Kentucky of FIU minus nine. FIU is minus four. Number three, Notre Dame at, against Navy from San Diego. I have Notre Dame minus 17. Notre Dame's giving 22 and a half. Number six, Texas at Oklahoma State. Texas, I have minus four and a half. Texas is giving three. Number 19, Oregon at Arizona. I have Oregon minus seven and a half. Oregon is favored at nine and a half. So I was off by two points there. It actually said Arizona minus 20 and a half. I think that was an error right there for sure. And I thought, oh, maybe they meant Oregon minus 20 and a half, but I thought it would have been ridiculous anyway. But they pretty much had the wrong line there. So Oregon minus nine and a half is the correct line. So I was too off. Hawaii at Fresno. At Fresno minus 15. Fresno's minus 23, so eight points off. San Diego State at Nevada. If San Diego State minus six and a half. And San Diego State is amazingly only a a two-and-a-half point favorite. That's very surprising to me, that line. Before I go, I want to go over the preseason AP poll for college basketball. That came out today, and I want to get to it with you guys real quick before I go. Number one is the Kansas Jayhawks with 1,581 points, so 1,581. The number two team is the Kentucky Wildcats, with 1,529 points. The number three team is Gonzaga with 1,461 points. Number four is Duke with 1,452 points. I am very surprised that Duke is not number one with all that talent they have. Number five is Virginia with 1,286 points. Number six is Tennessee with 1,268 points. Number 7 is Nevada with 1,230 points. Number 8 is North Carolina with 1,221 points. Number 9 is Villanova with 1,085 points. Number 10 is Michigan State with 1,024 points. Number 11 is Auburn with 974 points. Number 12 is Kansas State with 922 points. Number 13 is West Virginia with 678 points. 14 is Oregon with 638 points. 15 is Virginia Tech with 630 points. 16 is Syracuse with 620 points. 17 is Florida State with 530 points. 18 is Mississippi State with 451 points. 19 is Michigan with 437 points. 20 is TCU with 311 points. 21 is UCLA with 297 points. 23 is Clemson with 268 points. 23 is LSU with 187 points. 24 is Purdue with 170 points. And 25 is Washington with 165 points. Others receiving votes. Loyola Chicago came darn close to cracking this. They had 162 points. Number 27 pretty much would have been Marquette with 124 points. Indiana with 98, Florida at 71, Nebraska 35, Maryland 28, Wisconsin 24, Notre Dame 22, Cincinnati 21, Alabama 15, UCF 15, Buffalo 14, Arizona 14, Louisville 11, Miami 10, San Diego State 9, USC 6, Butler 6, Texas Tech 6, Texas 5, Arizona State 3, St. John's 3, Providence 2, Xavier 2, Missouri 1, NC State 1, Marshall won, and Davidson won. So there's your eight people, one through 25, and I gave off the quote-unquote others receiving votes. My initial reaction to this is that I'm surprised Villanova is not higher. I'm surprised Duke is not one. Tennessee's a little high for me. Virginia, I think, should be lower. Um, Kentucky and Kansas, I think, should be around three and four. 
Michigan State's right around where it should be. Same with Auburn. Same with West Virginia. I think Kansas State's too high. Oregon, I think, should be a little higher. Virginia Tech and Syracuse, I think, are a little high. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Virginia Tech and Florida State. Syracuse is right around where it should be, I think, because I like their chances this year. Mississippi State, I think, is going to be better. Michigan should be higher. TCU should be where it should be. UCLA should be a little higher. Clemson was decent last year. They should be higher. LSU, where did they come from? Purdue should be higher. Washington should be where it should be. I expect them to be, be improved. A team that's not in the top 25 that arguably should be, I think, is there's two, Indiana and Florida. I think those two teams have some talent. I think that with Indiana, Archie Miller should be much better than they were a year ago. Notre Dame's another team that I think deserved to be in the consideration for the top 25. Mike Bray has just been outstanding year after year after year. And they somehow don't get the respect that they deserve. I'm going to preview some college basketball starting next week. I'm going to make predictions for the big conferences such as the ACC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, the SEC, the Pac-12, the Big East. Maybe the AAC. I'm going to pick actually all the conferences, but I think the big ones are going to have their own podcast together, and then I'll do the smaller conferences together because there's not much to talk about with the smaller conferences rather than the big-time conferences. And then I'll make a prediction, an early, very early prediction on how the bracket's going to be, the Final Four and whatnot, and how the season will play out, and Upsets to look out for, and what else could I talk about? Hmm, coaches on the hot seat, full predictions, breakout players, and a lot more. So I can't wait for college football. And this was a good podcast. I got a lot in. Tomorrow I'm going to pick the World Series winner and talk about that series a lot. Go over Giants, Falcons, NBA, NHL, and anything else that goes on in the world of sports. And also I'll be doing power rankings and guess the lines for NFL Week 8. I hope you guys have a great day, everyone.